welcome, Morgan. <laughs> thank you oh, so thank much you. for coming on. Moms don't have time to read books to discuss thank you. wandering in strange lands. I'm so excited to talk to you. Likewise. Um, wow. This was like a labor of love. This is a lot of travel and research mm-hmm. and oh my gosh. So tell me about, first of all, tell me about the idea of coming up. Tell me about when you decided to write this book and why. And then okay. I want to hear about the journey to getting all the information. Yeah. So it it's going to be weird of how I got the inspiration for this book because the book went through many different iterations of what the scope was going to be. Um, I will say that the impetus for the book began with a movie. Um, it was Get Out. I was watching it in Magic Johnson Theater in Harlem, and there's a climactic scene where uh, Daniel Kaluuya's character, the black male protagonist, has his hand around his white girlfriend's throat. And, you know, she, she and his family has been trying to basically steal his body for the majority of the movie. And um, as soon as the police car pulls up, everybody gasps. Now, in a regular society, police would mean safety. Oh, yay, he's coming to arrest the white girl. But we as Black Americans know that the police often does not mean safety. And so I was fascinated that when we were um, in this theater, for example, um, we all had the same instinctual fear uh, and I knew, and I'm not a native Harlem. I, I'm a, I've been living here for five years, and I and I had a feeling that other people in this theater were not all so all natives to this neighborhood, and so that really fascinated me. Um, this idea of, of fear of state violence, fear of the state, um, and our precarious position on any type of American soil, and so I wanted to first investigate that intergenerational fear and trauma, and when I spoke about that. Um, to uh, friends of mine who are actually professors who are based in the Boston area. This is after the book was sold. Um, They told me, this sounds like a migratory story. That's how the book started to develop, not into just fear. That fear is a subcomponent, but these migratory patterns and how we are connected and also disconnected because of the violence of the state. Um, And so that's how the scope grew. Wow. (laughs) Um, I actually thought what you just said was one of the most, one of the most uh, memorable parts of the book Mm -hmm. and has applications for really everything in life was how Mm -hmm. you can really, you can, um, what's the word? Pass down trauma from generation to generation, even if you haven't lived it yourself, which I didn't even realize could happen. So if I have like a traumatic experience, am I, have I now doomed all my you know what I mean? Like, when does it have to happen? Does it have to happen before you? I mean, it must have to happen before you have kids or is it just a societal thing? What do you think? I don't know because, okay, so I, I, late last year, I got the once in a lifetime opportunity to be a guest professor at Leipzig University in Germany. And when I was there, one of the classes I taught was a, a literature seminar on Black women's interiorities across the diaspora. And I had one student there, and I still think about him to this day. He was from Israel. And we were talking about the intergenerational trauma of slavery. And he was liking it to the intergenerational trauma of those who are the descendants of Holocaust survivors. And so as I mentioned in my book, this, this, uh, this research has already been investigated by those such as Dr. Rachel Yehuda, where she studied, studied epigenetics and how trauma affects uh, gene mechanisms through uh, Holocaust survivors and their descendants. Well, then there was also Dr. Joy DeGruy, who uh, coined the term post-traumatic slave disorder. And it made me think about it because it's like, if you have a whole generation of people who have undergone just unspeakable stress to their psyches and their bodies, how could they not pass that down to children? Um, and so that was something that, that it's hard because you think I'm my own person and also because, you know, America is very individualistic in a way, for better or for worse, right? Because of how we're dealing with or not dealing with the pandemic. But that really got me to thinking about certain things, certain fears that I had, certain trepidations that if I just listen to a conversation happening with my mother's 
and her siblings, or even my grandparents, I'm like, now I see the echoes and the rippling effects. And that's something that I really wanted to demonstrate in Wandering in Strange Lands is just that echo that sort of happens from coast to coast, region to region, despite the fact that Black Americans are distinct, but also overlapping in terms of the disenfranchisement that uh, we face. Wow. See, I thought maybe, for instance, with the Holocaust, it was when you're born, it was more environmental, that if you're born into a family where the parents had experienced a trauma, it was the environment, like all that energy that just sort of transmits when you're around people who have gone through something awful versus Mm -hmm. does it actually shape your DNA? I don't know. It's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, Although then it's also sort of discouraging in a way, but hopefully, um, you know, when, with all the progress that gets made, then the future generations can have that sort of lifted. <laughs> yeah, or just be, or just don't forget the history. That's yeah. another thing. Like I remember, I read this. I don't know if you saw this article. I think it was published last week, where it said like like twenty three percent of Americans, like young adults, do not do, didn't think that the Holocaust happened or don't know about the Holocaust. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Right now, like there are people alive today whose fan whose parents were Holocaust survivors. What is going on with the public education system or just the American education system that we have that we have forgotten? <laughs> this is just, don't even depress me anymore. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, uh, I mean, just I can't even go there. The, uh, you know, it's like people who think the pandemic is a hoax. I mean, there are just some people out there who just don't respond to facts and science, or you know. Right. reality and you right. can't really do much right? right i don't know right but that's i mean just to bring it back around to the book and yes please <laughs> I, i'll try to bring it back around to the book but you see that is something that i also wanted to elucidate in wandering in strange lands is the different realities that we inhabit so a lot of times in african-american communities there can be a collision course between oral history, stuff that's passed around the communities and what is actually documented. And sometimes for people who are from communities that are disenfranchised, communities that have been violated, they don't always take the documentation to face value because they often know who has the power of, of this documentation. Those who are generally white, privileged, um, with a lot of networks and they're not, they're the complete opposite. So they had this suspicion and that was something that I learned early on. Something that I always did before I traveled anywhere was that I got in touch with people from that area. I got, I wanted them to know who I was, you know, what publisher I was, uh, I had to deal with my, my website, just so they knew that I was a real person. But also because, for example, when I went down to the low country, uh, Georgia, and I was uh, doing research on the Gullah Geechee communities, doing field research, you know, one of the women there, she told me, we've had people come down here, interview us without our consent, turn our stories into scholarship without proper acknowledgement. So they'd already been violated. And because even though I was black like them, I was coming from New York City. I was an, already a New York Times bestselling author. Um, I taught an Ivy League institution. Like I was the institution. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I had to really tread lightly. And that's something I didn't lose sight of. So Morgan, tell me more about your story. Tell me how you got started writing, how you became a bestselling. I mean, tell me the whole, tell me, give me like yeah. the, the Cliff's notes and all that yeah, stuff. Because it's it's so impressive. I mean, everybody thank you. just awesome. Thank you. Um so I thought that I wanted to be a doctor. My doc, my father was a doctor, you know, every time you ask a child, would it want to be a doctor, lawyer, whatever. I thought I wanted to be a doctor, take care of my doctor. I, I doc- never like, wanted to be a doctor. Just throwing well, that out what, there, that's great. science is not that's my thing. Great. But anyway, so I have so much well, respect I, for you and doctors and everything else. Well, uh, you, know, you know, science wasn't even my thing either. I just love the narrative of people's, okay. of people's lives and their bodies. But anyway, um, when I was in high school, I was bullied a lot. And I, I'm not a confrontational person. So I internalized a lot of that uh, low self-esteem and I wanted to escape. And because I didn't have a passport at the time, plus, plus I was a minor, the only way I could escape was through fiction. So I just started every day when I get home, I'd hurriedly do my homework and I'd start writing um, fictitious stories as a way to cope. And I continued to do that well into college um, when I matriculated at Princeton. And I knew that I wanted to be a writer, but 
I had a lot of colleagues who were applying to med school, applying to law school, going into banking. And it was like, oh my God, am I going to waste my degree and I should maybe try to get a job at like Goldman Sachs or something like that. <laughs> and um, when I graduated from college, I didn't get a job anywhere. I didn't get a job. I was applying for entry-level positions at publishing houses and literary agencies, assuming that that would be my way in. And I, and granted, I'd already done the unpaid internships. Like I was told, I was told you had to do unpaid internships in order to get a foothold, which as you know, that puts a lot of economically disadvantaged people with the short end of the stick. But I did all of that, graduated from the number one university in the country, still couldn't get a job. So I returned home jobless, heartbroken. The only thing that I had as an anchor was that I was in an MFA program at Bennington, which is a low residency program. But I had some insecurities there because I was the youngest and I was the only black person in my cohort. And I was like, oh my gosh, am I the token, even though I had a wonderful experience there. And when I was online, I was spending a, a, just an extraordinarily large amount of hours online, particularly on Twitter. And I'd seen people my age exchanging content and I was like, oh, you can exchange content and you can get paid for it? Well, then I'm going to do that then. And because I had so much time on my hands, I was able to amass a large amount of bylines in a short amount of time. And then everything just started to take off like a rocket. In 2015, I moved to New York. I was also, I also got an agent. I also met the woman who would become the acquiring editor for my first book um, through Twitter as well. And so by the time that I was, the week that I was graduating from my MFA program, I was fielding calls from editors interested in acquiring my first book. Okay. That was in June, 2016. January, 2018 is when this will be my undoing. Living at the intersection of black female and feminist in white America was released. It debuted in the New York Times bestseller list. And then from there, I, you know, I taught at Bennington as a teaching fellow. I taught at, um, uh, Columbia University, Leipzig University. I've done speaking engagements. And of course, I just released um, my sophomore book uh, in August of this year. Wow, that is exciting. Wait, can you tell me please what it's like to write a book and have it come out and be like an instant bestseller? What like what was that feel? Did tell me about the call you got or when you found out or how? It was oh, it was funny because, <laughs> oh my God. So I was on my book tour and I remember what it was like. It, I was I was in Atlanta. It was about an hour or so before I was going to get picked up to go to uh, the bookstore. I think it's for Charis Bookstore, Charis, I'm pronouncing it, C-H-A-R-I-S um, Bookstore. I think that was the one. And I was interviewing people for my second book. I, w my, I was trying to, because I knew I had a deadline and, you know, I wanted to hit the ground running. So I was literally on the call with, with like a scholar from UCLA and somebody is calling my other line. I'm like, who is calling me at this hour? Cause I'm like, why is my editor calling me at this hour? All of a sudden I, 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 I click over. Cause I'm like, I'm sorry. I got to take this. Cause somebody is like frantically calling my other <laughs> line. I click over and then they tell me the news. And then I was, and then I, I click back over mental, emotional whiplash. I tried to get through the, interview but I probably wanted to like scream at this lady who didn't know me from a can of paint as my folks would say and that's how it happened then on the way to the bookstore I cried I was in the car with my mom had the book event family members showed up that were that, were, that lived in Atlanta friends of mine from college showed up then when I came back to the hotel uh, my publisher sent me flowers and then I ordered a uh, room service with my mom and then I passed out <laughs> it was the best. It was the best. Um, but I mean, my experience as a debut author was incredible because I could not have asked for a better blowout. I knew that it was um, picking up steam because of the amount of anticipated lists that it was on. But in terms of just the book tour, the, the people that came out during my book tour and the reception, oh, I mean, I, I would want that for any debut author. I, I was very lucky or very blessed. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And now after that big tour with so much emotion and success and everything, now you have a book coming out into this much quieter time in life. How are you handling that transition? It doesn't feel quiet. Like for me, it was, it was, I think it's been hard for everyone. And I know that I am surrounded by a lot of literary citizens who we could be a bit self-deprecating when we're promoting our work. I wrote this thing of some personal news when it's like huge professional news or, or, you know, we often lament online about how, 
how weird we feel about promoting our stuff because we live in a society that often devalues art or devalues writing and, and, and especially devalues it as something that should be a monetary pursuit as well as a as a self-motivated passionate one um and so it often it, it, it's a tricky balance it's often and it's definitely a tricky balance when millions of people file for unemployment um you know stimulus checks that were sent months ago was only twelve hundred dollars it feels decadent to be like i wrote this book and here i'd like you to write it and so when my book was originally slated to come out of May of this year, and I live in New York City, so New York was the epicenter of the virus. And so I always tell people that it was nothing like I had ever experienced before because I couldn't hear a thing. What I mean by that is that, you know, I live near Central Park. I couldn't hear a dog bark. I didn't hear, you know, a bus approaching its stop. I didn't hear people arguing on the street. The only thing I heard every single um, day or night rather was the ambulance sirens and me just praying that I didn't know anybody in those vehicles. Um, it was, it was, I was surrounded by death. And so when everything, the city went into lockdown mode, I'm just trying to get my head together, you know? And so when my, my editors emailed me at the top of April and asked if we could push to August, I was happy about it. And usually I'm an impatient person. I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's go. But because I was trying to get myself prepared, like just emotionally um, prepared to reset for this different routine that I was going to have to do, I, I liked the extra time. But then as we know, as time went on, then George Floyd's more murder happened. Then the protests happened. And all of a sudden, my book took on this different kind of urgency that none of us could have predicted obviously and so in the beginning I was happy because I thought oh August is great because I thought silly me that everything would be opened again and also because there's so much traveling August is time for vacation I thought we could pitch it that way but then because of the protest then it started things started to be recalibrated and then things just start to move really quickly so when you say that you know it takes on like a quiet form it didn't feel that way at all um at all I take it back I shouldn't well, have no, said I mean, quiet. It felt quiet. Well, I mean, I'll say this. Like, I'll say it definitely felt quiet in the sense that, like, I'm a Gemini. I, I pride myself for being able to work a room anywhere I go. Like, I know that I could command attention and I project my voice in a way. And maybe it's because of, like, the insecurity complex of, like, being short, very short. So I try to project as how, much as How I can. short? I'm very I'm short, feet, too. I'm five feet tall. Okay. So um, I'm, so five, every I'm five too, but, but okay, every time fine. people meet me, they're always like, oh, I thought you were taller than what you were. Not every time they say this, but a lot of times when people meet me, they're like, oh, I thought you were taller than what you were. And I'm like, well, I, I think that as a compliment because I guess my personality is large, but also because I know how easy it is to be invisible, not only because of my height, but because I'm also a black woman. So I guess that has something to do with it. But, I, you know, when I love going on book tours and going into bookstores because I can project you can see people's gestures their faces the different like comments they make as you're telling your story and you get energy from them but when you're doing a zoom call you don't get that same interaction even though you do feel tuned in because people do q a stuff but it's different because now you have to deliver twice as much energy and you're not going to get that back so as i was doing these book tours in august and even though they were only an hour long i will be wiped out after them I, uh, I can relate to that. <laughs> it's also the contrast of like, you're sitting in one place doing your normal life. And then all of a sudden you're like, your space has to completely transition, right? right. Like, right. In a way you... where usually you go somewhere, like I'll go somewhere right. and have to like perform or be like on or whatever. And here I can just be in my like focus self. And then next thing you know, it's like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right and then but also like yeah exactly and then it's like I think about okay so when I was in Atlanta when it was announced that you know that I that I, I told the crowd that I, I just got on the bestseller list you know what I'm saying I, like I was with them and like like uh, 20 minutes before it was go time you know you meet the booksellers they're so nice they show you around the store they say here's where your book is um let us know if you want any water you could say here if you want to decompress and also like sometimes they have a pet a resident dog a resident cat so that books had a resident you know wiener dog <laughs> so it's like you saw the dog <laughs> move in and out of the crowds as people are just like enjoying themselves 
And it accounts for so much, you know, even when you're signing books, like it, that accounts for so much. And I'm not going to say I took it for granted, but it's just like, man, I would have loved to have like got my wardrobe together and like picked out the finest like makeup palettes, like go to the bookstore and especially in August, you know what I mean? And, and then like go and have a nice wine spritzer with friends or family afterwards. You know what I mean? Like there was so much that could have been done, but you know what I, but I'm lucky like with, with you know, podcasts like this one and also it's just like independent bookstores and booksellers like we really got ourselves in a shape because the thing about this whole time is it's unprecedented it's not like you can go to somebody else and be like well what did you do during this time when it happened 12 years ago none of us knows but despite the fact that we don't know we have been able to reorient I'm sure with difficulty but we're doing it and I think that that's pretty inspiring I agree. And I think there's some things that came out of it that will make regular life better going forward. You know, I so sure much, hope so. So yeah. much, uh, I don't know. I feel like so much of, um, of life was running around getting places and like, I don't know about your, I'm sure. I mean, Oh yeah. I the, the pandemic has made me prioritize breast a whole lot more. Yes. Like, you know, I, again, I live in New York. New York is very fitness heavy. And, you know, I've really been like, I was really focusing on like, I don't want to lose this much weight by the time my book comes out May 12th. And I had it all planned out with a personal trainer. And then, of course, the lockdown happened. And I was getting so upset because I was like, man, if the lockdown didn't happen, I'll be able to bench press my weight by now. I'll be able to do this. And I realized I'm like, but you're alive, though. Your body has kept you alive. And okay, you had junk food two days in a row. So what? Like, you're working under stress. So I think it's more of like, this pandemic has really forced me to do a whole reset and to just re and shift my thinking about like my body and stuff like that. I've never even tried to bench press my own weight. So the fact that that was a goal of yours, I, I, I applaud. I was going to go and getting there. I, it was going to go, but I was like, when I started bench pressing like 110 pounds, I was like, I could get here. I was like, I wow. could get here. I was almost there. I am, super, I am like beyond impressed. Thank that you. is up there with the instant New York Times bestseller. <laughs> but I don't know. If I, I don't know if I can bench press that now, though. I don't know. <laughs> right. not, not anymore. Not anymore. So what advice would you have um, for aspiring authors? Oh, man, just this is going to sound really weird. But if you have an idea in your mind that kind of makes you afraid, that's probably the one that you should investigate, I would say. Um, if you have an idea in your mind that it comes to you in flashes, sometimes when I have, I, I know a story is important when I can see certain scenes visually or certain lines come to me. That if you don't write it down, it's going to keep pestering you. It's going to haunt you in a sense. So I would always tell writers that, but also like don't ask for permission. And I say this especially for uh, uh, female writers or uh, writers of color or female writers of color. Uh, don't ask for permission. And that's the way that I had to be with my career. When I didn't get those jobs that I told you about, I could have, I, I definitely sulked, but I also was like, listen, I may not be the best writer out there, but I'm going to work harder than the best writer out there. So that involved me pitching relentlessly, getting rejected a lot and doing it all over again and just trying every single angle I could to shoot my shot, basically. So don't ask for permission. Don't wait for somebody to say, yeah, that's a good idea. Go for it. Just start writing. Um, and start telling a story and don't worry about it being perfect the first time. First drafts are supposed to be bad. You know what I'm saying? That's why it's the first draft. You can revise in layers. So I try to encourage writers to do the same. Oh, I love that. Thank well, you. Morgan, thank you. I feel like we didn't talk too much even about your book, which I felt like was so awesome. And I learned so much about your family and your background and thank all you. your um, amazing research skills and all this. So readers will just have to get the book and, and find out the, the backstory, uh, yes. so to speak. <laughs> yes. so wandering in strange lands. Um, thank you, Morgan. This was such a thank nice, you. a nice chat. <laughs> thank you. It was a pleasure right. talking to you. Okay. okay you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.